I'm Elizabeth Slattery, and welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. There isn't a scheduled sitting this week, so the justices are likely hard at work writing opinions in the cases they've heard so far this term. I wanted to share an interview I recently came across with Justice Gorsuch. He and one of his law clerks, Toby Young, sat down with Andrew Kaufman of the George W. Bush Presidential Library's Strategerist podcast last fall. It's a great conversation, so please enjoy it, and also check out the podcast, The Strategerist. So I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous right now, because there have been 114 Supreme Court justices in the history of the United States, and we are joined by one of them today. Our guest is Justice Neil Gorsuch, also author of A Republic, If You Can Keep It, which is now a New York Times bestselling book. Justice Gorsuch, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a delight to be here. The last time I was at the Bush Library was during the groundbreaking ceremony. Moving some dirt. You've made some progress. (laughs) We've got, we are really proud of that progress too. And we have a special co-host today. Toby Young was with the Bush Center from the start until she left recently to spend a year as a clerk at the Supreme Court for Justice Gorsuch. Her title here was legal counsel, but really she was a lead voice of wisdom. Toby, we're really glad you're back today. Oh, thank you, Andrew. It's wonderful to be back and see so many great friends and to get to bring Justice Gorsuch to see the library. Toby just finished her year with me. And do and you realize, according to our librarians. She's apparently the first enrolled tribal member to ever serve as a law clerk at the Supreme Court. You know, I was reading that. It's uh, which which tribe is it? Chickasaw. Chickasaw. And uh, which what side of your family is that from? It's my father's side. That is, it's it's amazing that we've had that as many people that have come through working there that you're the first and. It's, it also goes to show that the, that you're bringing in multiple voices, and I think that's a huge part of being a part of our a few, government. A few Western voices. <laughs> a, col- a Colorado voice like yourself. And an Oklahoman like Toby's. Very proud Western voices. So, Justice Gorsuch, I've started reading your book, uh, A Republic, if you can keep it, and there's some great civics lessons in there. But before we really get to civics and history, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like being on the Supreme Court. I think there's a bit of a mystery there for a lot of us, and the way you describe it, it almost sounds like just any other office in the United States and any other workplace. What what is life like on the Supreme Court? Uh, it's both very different than any other workplace and very much the same. Uh, it's obviously an honor and a humbling privilege to come to work in a place where only 114 men and women have ever served. Um, and the work we do is important. There's no question about it. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, it's nine people. It's a small office. There are only a couple hundred people in the whole building. People get to know one another, care for one another. I clerked there 25, 30 years ago, and there are even employees there who remember me or claim to (laughs) from my days as a law clerk. How about that? Um, And we do have fun together. I mean, I think that's one thing we don't hear enough about in our fractious clickbait world is that uh, people are still people. Uh, and even justices are people. Um, we shake hands every time we get together, no matter how difficult the moment or tense the issue. And that tradition's gone on for 150 years or so. We eat lunch together most days that we have argument or conference, which is most days. And of course, it's the government, so it's bring your own lunch. <laughs> um, we sing happy birthday to one another. We have holiday parties where we also sing very, very badly, but enthusiastically. Um, Toby brought her daughter in and participated in one of our uh, annual events. Why don't you tell them about that, Toby? Well, a little known secret is the justices put on a trick-or-treat party for the children of the employees at the Supreme Court. But even better, my justice, Justice Gorsuch, escorted the kids to every office. (laughs) And I can tell you who maybe had a little more fun than anyone. (laughs) Um, And it was, you know, just a wonderful event to have pictures with Romilly meeting justices and other children. And just, you know, she was because Justice Gorsuch loves families and has two girls of his own. He really allowed her to be sort of the mascot of Chambers this year. She rode her tricycle down the hall and um, (laughs) got to know everybody and um, little things you would never guess happen behind the doors of the Supreme Court. Yeah, we all saw your, your Instagram post and we're like, man, that a year ago, Toby was here hanging out with us. And here's her picture with her daughter with uh, a couple of Supreme Court justices. And she's she's doing all right. 
Yeah, she's. I, I would like to be Romilly Young someday. She <laughs> she has a pretty good life, um, but you know, it's not just that. It's some of the you know fun jokes that y'all play on each other. I know there's one you've told me before about Justice Sotomayor right before y'all went into the courtroom. There's some practical jokes I won't share with you, hmm. but here's one I will. Um, so every time we go on the bench, we all put on our robes. And we line up. It's like grade school or something. <laughs> There's even a bell that calls you in. There's a, it's a buzzer. That really is it school. Really, it does. That reminds me of middle school. <laughs> the, the five minute buzzer means time to go put on your robe. And then you line up just like, just like in school, like you're going to the bathroom or something, you know? And <laughs> anyway, we line up and we line up in order of seniority. That is really I mean, like it's school. all it is totally like school. So one morning, I guess the New York Yankees had had a particularly good season again. A- again, I'm a Rockies fan. So Rangers. Yeah, yeah. my heart goes out to you, too. <laughs> and uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, comes in wearing a robe with pinstripes and the New York Yankees logo on the chest. And I think my colleagues, a couple of them might have, you know, they, they were quite taken aback. I mean, and we have some Yankees fans, but they, they were still quite surprised. And we're lining up and we're about to go in the courtroom. And finally, one of them asks, Sonia, are you really going to wear that on the bench? She pauses and replies, no, but I was just waiting for you to ask. <laughs> And uh, apparently Justice Breyer loves knock-knock jokes. He has an endless reservoir of really bad knock-knock jokes. And I I think his grandkids share with him. And yeah, when we have lunch together, uh, we don't talk shop. We talk life. And we talk about grandkids, among other things. And and Justice Breyer graces us with his knock-knock jokes. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, a big part of... The job description, as I understand it, um, is that you will have disagreements with your colleagues on a regular basis. And, and, you know, they might be really a a really intense disagreement. But how do you keep things civil when you're when you're in a state of having to disagree professionally with your colleagues so often? Well, it's it's easy. Um, These are people who love this country. And when you're looking someone in the eye and you're disagreeing strongly over an important issue, but you know they love the country every bit as much as you do, that makes it a little easier, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And you know they've given over their life to this country for its service. And a lot of them could have made a lot more money um, and even been more famous. Um, And they've chosen the career path that they've chosen of public service for a reason. I can respect that. Every day of the week, every hour of the day, they're good people, they're kind people, and they care about this country. And, you know, one of the things just like the knock knock jokes and and you learn even, even on the clerk level when you all get together is you find when you sit down and you talk with people and you learn about them, you learn that you often have a lot more in common than than not. And when you know about someone's family and what's going on in their life, it makes you a lot more likely to give them the benefit of the doubt. And, um, you know, they put it all on the paper and enjoy each other's company. Well, here's the other thing with that, I, I guess I'd say is what you hire us to do? You hired us to resolve the most difficult cases in the country. Shocking headline. There might be some disagreement from time to time. <laughs> right. It's not a surprise. It, it comes with the profession and it comes with the role. So I think that helps too. But you know what would be a surprise to people is I think the headlines tell you a 5-4 yeah. decisions, but... Maybe talk about the combination of 5-4 decisions from this past term to give people a little peek beyond the headlines. Oh, I'm going to give them a longer peek then. I'm going to tell them the whole story. Excellent. Love it. All right. Yeah. So people like to focus on disagreements. And certainly, I think the media today, clickbait yeah. leads us that direction. For sure. Um, and we're all guilty of it. I'm not pointing any fingers. Um But I wonder if people know in this country how strong the rule of law really is. And I don't mean to disparage any other country, but just take a look at our own. And here are a few facts that I think make me optimistic and I think are underappreciated. There are 50 million lawsuits filed in this country every year. We are a litigious bunch. Now, I'm not counting your parking tickets (laughs) or your or your 
traffic speeding tickets. That's a whole nother 50 million. All right. So 50 million lawsuits. Now I'm going to share figures from the federal court system because I know them by heart, though I think they're probably even more impressive on the state court system. 95% of that 50 million are resolved by the trial court without an appeal. Now, lawyers represent losing parties all the time and losing parties are never happy. But sometimes they just want to know that they've been heard by a neutral judge or a neutral jury and they accept the judgment of the court. That happens 95% of the time in our system. That's remarkable. All right, what about those 5% that go to an appeal, like to my old court, the 10th Circuit? I served on the 10th Circuit for over a decade. It covers 20% of the continental United States, two time zones, diverse judges from every walk of life. And I served with judges appointed by President Obama all the way back to President Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson. We sit in panels of three, and we're able to resolve those 5% of cases that actually do go to appeal unanimously 95% of the time. I think that's pretty incredible. So you say, all right, fine. What about the Supreme Court? We decide 70 cases a year. That's it. Now, I have friends back in Colorado who decide 70 cases before lunch. (laughs) All right. These are the hardest cases. These are the ones where the lower courts have disagreed strongly. And that's why we take the case. And we have nine judges, not three anymore. And they're appointed by five different presidents over the course of 25 years from the whole of the country. Now, New York is disproportionately represented, but we'll put that aside. All right. We managed to reach unanimous agreement, the nine of us, 40 percent of the time. That's pretty good. That's, that's incredible, right? Get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch, all right? Can't do it. Get, I, exactly. So I think that's pretty incredible. And when you say, what about the five to fours? That's about 25 to 33% of our docket, all right? And those numbers, by the way, have been consistent since 1945 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt had appointed eight of the nine justices of the Supreme Court. So if we're doing as well as they did when they were all appointed basically by the same president... I say we're doing all right. And the only thing that's new is that nothing's new. And of those five, four decisions, Toby, Toby wanted me to point out, we had 10 different combinations of justices on the five, four decisions this last term. So it's not, all, it's not always the same five voting one way and the same four voting I mean, the other way. That, that, is, that is not accurate information. Right. So that that's actually brings us into civics a little bit. And your, your book... Uh, there was a great line in it that says that the founding fathers and so much about the book harkens back to the founding fathers, which is such a great historical pr- perspective that is good to keep in mind. And one of the things that you mentioned is that each branch of government, the founding fathers acknowledge both their virtues and their vices. Can you talk a little bit about what that, how the, how the founding fathers have set up a government that has lasted as long as it has, that is by and for the people? Well, I, I think the key to it all is the separation of powers. And that sounds wonky and high school civics and boring. But as a judge, I've come to see how the separation of powers really is what keeps us free. And that when you ignore it, uh, that's, when, that's when your liberty starts really getting affected. The Bill of Rights is wonderful. I'm, I don't mean to disparage the Bill of Rights, but everyone knows how the First Amendment contributes to their freedom. I'm not sure they appreciate how much the separation of powers contributes to their freedom. Um, and my, my story on that goes something like this. If you want to look at bills of rights, ours isn't very good. There are better ones in the world. My favorite is North Korea's. It promises all the things we promise, every one of them, and other things besides free education, free medical care, and my favorite, the right to relaxation. But those are just promises. And, and James Madison knew this when he wrote the Bill of Rights. He didn't think he needed one. If you got the Constitution, if you got the separation of powers right, you'd keep this country free by keeping power out of any one set of hands. And promises are only as good as the enforcement mechanism behind them, right? right. A Bill of Rights is a set of promises he recognized. And that, those promises in North Korea aren't worth the paper they're written on because all power lies in one man's hands. In this country, I am one-ninth of one-third of the federal government, which is one half of the government in the United States. That is the brilliance of our design, James Madison knew. That's what keeps us free. Your book is called A Republic If You Can Keep It. 
Are you optimistic about the next generation taking up the mantle? Well, I think the separation of powers and all the rest of our Constitution is only as good as the people, right? Um, the people have to want it. I think Ronald Reagan said, you know, tyranny is only one generation away. You know, we're not bound together by a common culture or history as a country. We're bound together by ideas that we share and agree on. So that is a very contingent and special reality. And republics haven't always succeeded. As a matter of fact, ours may be the longest living republic in history. But am I optimistic? You bet you. And you're part of the reason why Toby Young. I get to meet wonderful young people who care about this country, who are willing to put up with the difficulties of serving it. And the difficulties, I think, for your generation are a lot more so than they were for mine, the social media and some issues in our culture today. But I see wonderful young people like Toby who step forward courageously, fearlessly, because they know it's the right thing to do, and because they know that this country is a lot more important than any of us. So Toby is maybe the first Native American to serve on the Supreme Court. My two co-authors, Janie Nitze, her family escaped communism, Czechoslovakia. She managed to go to Harvard. Amazing. Yeah. David, David Fetter, uh, another Another uh, co-author of mine, his family are Mexican immigrants on one side and Holocaust survivors on the other. He saved his penny going to Cal Poly for undergraduate because his dream was to go to law school. He managed to get himself into Harvard and graduate first in his class. Those are the kinds of young people I encounter every day. A young man whose family uh, survived you know, World War II in the Japanese internment camps in this country. And they all saw America as a beacon. And they all, well, they know its problems too. And they're, but they're dedicated to its service and to making this a more perfect union. And yeah, when I get to spend time with people like, like the, those young people, you betcha I'm optimistic. How do we make sure that the next generation is as dedicated as, as the one before it? Part of it is teaching, right? We all, we all have an obligation. And it isn't something we can fob off on the middle school uh, government teachers. It's something we all have a duty to do, um, by example. Um, and I think places like this, uh, museums and libraries are important, and they need to find ways to reach young people and not be dull and dry. And I know you have a lot of wonderful interactive exhibits here. I just was at the Reagan Library where they have an actual situation room and an Oval Office and an Air Force One where the kids get to do um they pretend they're the president and the secretary of defense and they have some sort of scenario they have to resolve. Make some decisions fast. Yeah. And they have 60,000 kids who go through that every year. And the Bush uh, library has a situation room here too, that was used during president Bush's administration. I, I, so it's great. I'm eager to see that. Um, <laughs> and I just think things like that, right. everything we can do to reach young people where they are. Um, I applaud you for what you're doing and thank you for what you're doing. Keep it up. Well, and Toby knows our, one of our programs well, the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which that's one of, I think, one of the, uh, a shiny example of how, of getting people that are from opposite sides of the aisle to talk to each other and, and not just help them do it, but make sure that they can continue to spread the word. Toby, I know you traveled with them a lot and got to see some of those examples. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of the common thread you see is exactly what Justice Gorsuch is talking about. It's just the courage to put yourself out there and be a little uncomfortable and you end up finding, you know, it's a fun ride. I mean, I jumped ship and moved to Washington with my family and it's been a great experience. So, you know, I would encourage everyone just like Justice Gorsuch has just sign up for service. You're never going to regret jumping in and doing something for your country. Well, one of the things we're, we're running out of time. So one of the things that we always ask our guests is one of two questions. And the one we're going to we're going to pose at you is what as a nation should we be talking about that we're not talking about enough right now? Toby, what do you think? I'm curious. Well, I think it really is civics and exactly what your book is about. I think a lot of what you talk about and travel the country working with young people is the fact that we're not teaching civics anymore. And people don't know that our country is so distinct in the shining beacon. And, you know, you talk a lot about people say they're citizens of the world. Right. And what does that mean? When you don't have the rights backed up, who in the world is backing up your liberties and your rights? So I, I think we need to talk a lot more about civics and and, you know, Hamilton. We've talked about Hamilton and some of the, you know, the art and shows that are 
making it seem interesting again and not just reality television, right? The, the government and the raucous republic that, that formed. Yeah, the, the, I think the answers for me are, are what's in the book, right? Civics, civility, separation of powers and how it contributes to your liberty. Why you should be an originalist in the interpretation of the Constitution. So those are some of the things I'd, I'd, I'd say that I'd love to, for people to talk about more. I'm going to go home and look up what exactly that means as a, as a lay person. Like, Good. Originalist well, versus. That's what I, they- Stay tuned tonight. He'll have a lot <laughs> to say on it. And um, I'm going to throw in one last question for you um, or an additional question. Please do. Just because um, you and Justice Kavanaugh were both in the Bush administration. Yes. And you tell a great story about throwing Justice Kavanaugh's welcome dinner. And I would love for you to be able to share it with people in the, in, that are listening to the podcast and familiar with Justice Kavanaugh as well. I'd be d- delighted to share that. Um, so uh, the junior justice, everything's done by seniority at the court. It always is in life, isn't it? It is. Has to throw the new justice who comes on board a welcome party. And Justice Kagan had thrown a wonderful welcome party for me and Louise. And she knew Louise loves Indian food. So she brought in a chef, local chef, who um, is a very famous Indian cook. And it was the most splendid feast you could ever want. Well, when Justice Kavanaugh arrived, I, I had a bit of a problem because I've, I've known Brett a while, long time. And he's a meat and potatoes guy. <laughs> there's no Indian food. There's no. Bring in. there's, the, the food was going to be boring. <laughs> and I just... It, it just was. And so I had to do something to spice the thing up. And so at the end of dinner, I asked all of my colleagues and their spouses to please follow me from the dining room down to the great hall of the Supreme Court of the United States. Huge marble ceilings, marble busts, echoey, you know, formal, dignified place. Hollowed ground. Hollowed ground. And then I handed the Chief Justice a checkered flag. Justice Kavanaugh is a huge baseball fan and he really loves the Washington Nationals. And if you ever go to the Nationals Park, you'll see their mascots are four presidents. These giant foam headed presidents are about 12 feet tall. I mean, they're huge and they run around. Well, my excellent assistant, Jessica Bartlow, went online and she found out you can rent them. (laughs) <laughs> so we rented two of the presidents and we had a race in the great hall, of the Supreme Court of the United States and with the chief justice with the checkered flag. And it was you versus Justice Kavanaugh? No, no. It was President Washington versus President <laughs> Jefferson. <laughs> and, and Washington won. He's the father of the country. Sure. He should win. And I, I'll be honest, I wasn't sure how that one was going to go over. Uh, I thought that one was better to ask. Forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's actually something we have in common. Um, Mike McMahon, who is our VP of development, sitting in the room today. Ken Hirsch, our CEO, and uh, Wyatt Smith, another friend. The four of us actually also raced in those giant head costumes at a Ranger game. And, you know, it's it's hot in those things. That's, I, that's, I understand that. I've, I've actually gotten to be friends with the young men who, who do it at, at, at the Nats. And they've come visit, and, and I visited them. And, and yes, they, they do. But they're all incredibly fit. You have to, I mean... <laughs> You have to be to carry that thing around. And not only that, they're, they're top heavy. You kind of always yes. feel like you're falling forward. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Justice Gorsuch, this was an incredible treat. We can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Uh, a Republic, if you can keep it now, a New York Times bestseller is available anywhere you get your books and be sure to get a copy. It's a, it's a good read. I stopped by Barnes and Noble on my way over here and signed a few. So, all right, noted. There, are, there are a few that are still for sale. I noted here, he, here in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Thank you. It Jeff. was fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening to SCOTUS One Hundred and One. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and please leave us a five star rating. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS101, and you can email us at SCOTUS101 at heritage.org with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes. You've been listening to SCOTUS101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Elizabeth Slattery. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, and Mark Guiney. For more information, visit heritage.org.